Hello and welcome to Lancaster Hi-Fi. This is part two of my series on the build of the DGSE-1, particularly featuring the build that I did last summer in July and August of 2022. Part one covered the circuit diagram of the DGSE-1, as well as some changes and decisions that had to be made in order to put the DGSE-1 which was originally designed for the Magnavox 8600 series amplifier and put it in the AMP 196 chassis, which has a different power transformer, a different rectifier tube, but the same, basically the same everything else. I also covered some modifications that I have tried out in that video. Part two, is going to deal with planning how to cram all this stuff into this relatively small steel chassis. And specifically, of course, the AMP 196, although the 8600 is also a pretty small chassis. So I just wanted to share the process, the method that I used, and you know, show you some of the decision-making process and planning process of how to build a point-to-point -point wired amplifier. I hope you enjoy. I hope you find it interesting and useful. And if you do, hey, give me a subscribe, a thumbs up, whatnot. Enjoy. I'm building this single-ended tube amp based on 6BQ5 or EL84 tubes for the outputs and 12AX7 triode tube on the inputs. I'll show you here, and I'll show you in more detail, the process by which I've laid out the amp using a few simple drafting tools for assistance. Morgan Jones suggests, rather than a circuit board type approach, a more three-dimensional approach, which can be he cautions, a mess if not properly planned. So what I've done here is, first of all, I've traced out the outline of the chassis on the paper, like so, and included the places where the tubes are, where the output transformers are, where the power transformer is, where the holes that are already drilled are, uh, here's the rectifier tube position. You can also see superimposed here the outline of the choke. And I take those as essentially fixed things, things that I can't change. And then I've taken mylar, not mylar, then I've taken vellum and put it over the top, taped it at one end, and drawn on the various components including, for example, this power input module, which you can see the outline of traced here. And I've drawn in where all the wires are going, where all the components and wiring goes, and also where the speaker jacks are going to go. Now, my first draft wasn't as good, and it also wasn't as good because I did it all on the same sheet of paper without the vellum. The vellum has a couple of advantages. One is that you can try again. All I need to do to do a second draft is simply put on a new sheet of vellum. And I've already got the outline of the amplifier there. The other thing that I noticed that is particularly nice about the vellum is that it erases very well. When I make a mistake or when I want to change something, the erasure is more complete on the vellum than it is on the regular paper. I'll note a few things. I've got the test points here and here. I've got the trim pots for setting the bias. And I've just got all the various components and including the, the heater wires. This is now a bottom view. <laughs> the drawing that I have under here is a top view, so everything's flipped. 
this away, the test point terminals. You can see here the holes for the trim pots. I've got the 6 volt heater supply going right over to the corner here. This is the sort of scheme that's recommended by Morgan Jones. If you've got a steel chassis, first of all, twist the heater supply wires together and put them in the corner of the chassis. And that provides some shielding. And so those go, in this case, underneath or from the top down view on top of the power supply module right along the, in that corner over to the first pentode here. And I'll run additional wires to the different tubes. Let me address the goals of this schematic. The basic goal is to provide the best sound and implement some modern improved components. In particular, we need room for this power input module. Several components that I might need to include discreetly are packaged within this module. This module includes a fuse, it includes filter capacitors, it also includes a common mode choke. It's a TE connectivity module. TE connectivity is a good brand for these input modules. Here's my input power module. AC input goes the bottom and top terminal spades on this power input module. And this is the ground spade, and that will go to this ground lug right here. So here are my output binding posts. So in the previous design, the wires to the output had to cross over or through or whatever, navigate the power circuitry here and risk picking up hum. In my prototype, I mitigated that simply by using shielded cables to cross that gap. In the final design, I've simply moved the outputs over here to get the outputs closer to the power output pentodes and transformers and further away from the power circuitry over here. We've still got this proximity right here. It is what it is. There's only so much room. That is really the major challenge in the design is that the chassis is relatively small. What else does this accomplish, or what were my other needs? Well, I wanted to fit bigger output transformers on here, so the actual location of the output transformers is similar, but slightly different in that it required some new holes. I decided to put in a couple of extra terminal strips, that is, these sorts of things. This terminal strip here, and this terminal strip here, in order to provide a little bit more tidiness. The power input module is where the original multicap would be, so I need to find a place for the new capacitors, and I've put those up here. And the way I've drawn them here, they're sort of stacked up two across, two deep. So one of the challenges in this, in this drawing is that I'm trying to depict three dimensions. And that's an important difference between a typical point-to-point -point wiring in a tube amp and a circuit board in a modern solid-state amp, or a circuit board in any amp, is that the circuit board is two-dimensional. In the point-to-point -point wiring tube amp, we have a third dimension to utilize. So where you see all these wires crossing each other over here, that's utilizing that third dimension. What it allows us to do is optimize the angles of those crossings. In particular, the best practice is to have different wires crossing at right angles so that the induced field is nearly invisible to the other wire. Another change is the inputs up here. So the original inputs would have been both right smack next to each other up here. In my modification, I'm just putting one of the inputs in the original hole and using the balance pot hole for the other input. Put the input jacks here and here. So that's why 
the positioning is not so neat and tidy. Doesn't seem like well, like, why are why are they staggered like that? Why are they so far apart? It's better to have them farther apart because modern RCA jacks are bigger. Typically, we like the aesthetic of them being aligned with one another. Of course, that's not necessary. And I decided in this case that utilizing the original holes was preferable to, you know, drilling a new hole or, you know, patching the old hole, drilling a new hole, whatever, simply to get these aligned with one another. The original amplifier utilizes a bunch of different lugs. Here's a ground lug. Here's a ground lug. Here's a ground lug. Here's a ground lug. Oh, here's a ground lug as well. I flattened this ground lug quite a bit in order to use this hole to mount a terminal strip. And I've somewhat flattened the others, although not as flat as this one. I've left just this ground lug protruding. This is going to be my central ground for my star ground scheme that I'm going to use. So here's the location of that ground lug. I just noticed that one thing I don't show is that this ground lug will be connected to the power input module ground here. And all the negative terminals on these capacitors for the power supply go directly to this ground lug. Now for a good star ground, you want to give a, a high capacity or a, a low gauge lead from that power supply ground for your central signal ground. So this is my central signal ground and everything else is starred off of that. So here's my uh, left channel star point. Here's my right channel star point. I'm not showing some of the ground connections. This ground will con be connected uh, to here this ground will be connected to here. I do show that this ground point is connected to the output ground terminal. This ground point is connected to this, to the right channel ground terminal. I've talked before about adding these test point terminals and these trim pots here. I just realized that I left something off of my drawing. Specifically, I need resistors from pins 4 and 5 to pin 3 of one of the output pentodes. It would probably be best to do it on this first one, since it's the first split off of the main line. I'll draw that in right now. I need to make a decision on how I'm going to do this power supply. We simply add a dropping resistor here to get us down to the 265 volt B plus that the design calls for. If I go with that and I go with these resistors in series, the issue then becomes where the hell do I put them? And there are a couple of things to consider. So I need to go from here to here with these things. So there's simply the issue of how big they are. They take up a certain amount of space. And making the connections with the leads that I have or connecting new leads. There's also the heat that they're going to dissipate and the general consideration of keeping power supply stuff as far from signal as possible. If I were to put the resistors down here somewhere, I would be keeping power supply relatively far from signal, which is up here but they'd be sitting right next to these capacitors, which need to be kept cool. And so I'd have this buttload of heat dissipated out of these things sitting right next to these capacitors. So that's really a no-go. I could put them way over here. That could be an option, but then I'd have to run relatively long leads. So that lead leaves me with up here. So that might involve something like this, stacking these two, something like that, and arranging them such that I make the jump from here to here. I think I've got a solution. So I'm going to use these two holes way over here to mount this terminal strip on one and this terminal strip on the other. And then I'll simply run leads back over to where I need them. So let's make some sense of this diagram. Here's the power input module. So AC power is coming in here. 
and coming out here going to the transformer buck modification is blah -de blah here and then we've got power coming out the secondary here these yellow wires are the 5 volt supply for the rectifier tube and the red wires are the AC power coming out at like 290 volts each relative to this red yellow wire which goes to ground that's the center tap of the secondary for the main power part of the transformer so the yellow is the heater but that's also the end of the diodes if you will so from one of those we go to the choke this is the choke over here out of the choke then we come over to here and then we've got one wire going all the way over here to the first of these dropping resistors going through with the one dropping resistor through the second and then back over to this terminal so that's our b1 and then another dropping resistor and our b2 right here and here are the capacitors that go with all of that from b1 we take power to one output transformer and to the other output transformer b2 goes over to this b2 and over to this b2 for the right and left channels respectively so left channel b2 gets supplied to one half of the triode right channel b2 gets supplied to the other half of the triode so here is our dual triode signals coming in here right channel left channel you can see going to one part of the triode going to other part of the triode one part of the triodes going to this output tube here one of the 6bq5s other triode output going to this pentode here and you can see i've just drawn in all the various resistors and capacitors just trying to keep track of what's going to have to cross where being somewhat mindful of where to route things like ac lines in the corner of the chassis where i'm going to have to cross stuff so looking at some of this you know let's make this crossing at right angles especially since this is an ac heater line let's see output then of course comes from the output transformers here and here so to one channel to the other channel and that's all there is to it so as you can see that gets a bit complicated so if you didn't follow all of that I think you can probably understand at least the need for drawing it out in the first place that is you know having some kind of plan one that is erasable and revisable as you go that's the end of part two thanks for watching hope you learned something from all of that got something out of it at least and i hope i'll talk to you soon have a great day